great to see everybody here in person, to be uh, united again as a Board of Regents and with our staff. Um, Zoom is wonderful, but becomes sterile after a year and a half or whatever. Uh, and uh, the, just in our early morning meeting this morning, the camaraderie of uh, the Regents and the staff uh, has been uh, warming and welcoming. Uh, as a reminder, this meeting is being currently uh, live streamed. I am Jay Seal. I am Vice Chair standing in for Chair David, who may join us later this morning. Uh, members, when you would like to speak or make a motion, you need to turn on your microphone. And the microphone um, has a gray button on it. And when you press the gray button, the green light turns on and only then is your microphone on. Uh, and you may turn it off when you complete your comment. The request to speak button next to the microphone stalk does not work, so don't use it. If you would like to, uh, if you'd like to be recognized and speak, just raise your hand and uh, we'll, uh, we'll call on you and recognize you. Uh, it's now time to uh, have a roll call, and Christine, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Regent David? Regent Ewing? Here. Regent Finley? Here. Regent Levy? Here. Regent May? Regent McDonald? Regent Meir? Present. Regent Perez? Regent Pryor? Regent Seal? Here. Regent Solomon? Here. Regent Sterling? Here. Regent Temple? Here. Regent Weil? Here. Regent Williams Brown? She's here. And Regent Jackson? Here. We have a quorum. The next item on the agenda is public comments. Christine, has anyone signed up to make public comments? Not this at morning? this time. No, sir. All right. Uh, next, we'll move on to the uh, approval of the minutes from the September 22nd meeting. Regents, you've all been presented with a copy of the minutes for your review. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the September 22nd, 2021 meeting. So moved, sir. Uh, motion made by Regent Ewing. Second. Second um, by Regent Temple. Is there any discussion on that motion? Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, the motion passes. We'll next move to the uh, chair's comments, and I will make the comments that uh, Regent David um, has prepared. The first thing is to announce two fantastic honors that have been bestowed on our Commissioner of Higher Education this month. Last week during the LSU homecoming, Dr. Reed was named uh, an LSU legend by the AP Turo Black Alumni Chapter. For those of you who do not know, the, um, in the commissioner's office, right above her light switch, hangs a piece of art by A.P. Turo, Jr. He was the first black student to attend LSU, and his father, A.P. Turo, Sr., sued the university so his son could go there. Dr. Reed has said that the painting reminds her of the service, bravery, and legacy of those who fought for civil rights and it serves as a visual representation uh, of the doors that were opened, the sacrifices that were made, and the struggles that were overcome. To be named a legend at your alma mater is no small feat, but then we know that the commissioner has been recognized over and over again for her uh, accomplishments, and we take great pride and admiration in that. And tomorrow, uh, she will be recognized in New Orleans uh, at the Girl Scouts of East Louisiana, uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe Leadership Luncheon, at the Audubon Tea Room. Each year, the Four Pillars Award is given to a notable woman in the community in reference to the four pillars of Girl Scouting, STEM, outdoors, leadership skills, and entrepreneurship. The award is designed to recognize the many contributions Dr. Reed has made to our state and to highlight her role as a model for Girl Scouts everywhere. Additionally, 
uh, a former Regents member, Charlotte Bollinger, is also being recognized as the Girl Scouts Outstanding Woman of the Year. Again, congratulations to Dr. Reed, and please extend our greetings to Regent Bollinger as well. You know, I envision that in uh, Dr. Reed's home, there is a large room off to the side in which her awards are displayed. <laughs> and uh, and as, this, as her career progresses, the need to expand that room would seem to be the case. Uh, Chairman David has appointed a nominating committee to nominate officers uh, of the board for the next year. And the nominating committee appointed by Chair David is uh, Regent Seal as chair of the committee, Regent Perez, Regent Ewing, Regent Pryor, and Regent Weil. Finally, um, we'd like to recognize Regent Jackson, who's shown a tremendous maturity and leadership at Grambling in response to the recent shootings on campus. Uh, we'd like to ask you now if you would update us uh, on that important issue and any other student-related topics you'd like to present. Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, once again, my name is Cameron T. Jackson. I'm from the still city of Birmingham, Alabama, and I go to Grambling State University, and I've been humbly elected to serve as the 2021-2022 student board member to the Board of Regents. Um, so f just to talk about the shooting just a little bit, it was a traumatic experience. Um, it was homecoming. Homecoming is something where we literally take the name of and say home. Um, it's where our alumni come home. They want to engage with the students. Um, and I feel like this is a universal issue, like um, gun violence, gun awareness is something that we need to talk about. So that's one of the campaigns that I also started working on, um, talking to some fellow student body presidents, seeing if they would hop on board too, not only in the state of Louisiana, but actually expanding out, because that's something that we need to do. Um, but just moving into more so student board related things here for the Board of Regents, um, I want to start with my COVID update. So. Uh -uh. I met with Ms. Sharita Talian. Um, we discussed some vaccine campaign initiatives. Um, they were great. I told her about like one of the um, things that I had hosted, which is the why opt out, and we talked about that last go around. Um, and basically, I wanted to know like why were students opting out. I really wanted to know those sensitive conversations that we needed to approach, and how could we actually navigate through those to make sure that we um, put out information so students could not be so hesitant about vaccines, right? Um, then we established the task force, the COVID-19 task force. Um, Governor Edwards, he actually just did like one of the student highlights and I was the first one to go. Um, and it was kind of neat to see the controversy that was under the post because you want to know like what are people saying about the vaccines so we could um, truly work towards it, debunking those myths and things of that nature. Um, so the COVID um, task force itself as far as on the student part is going to be divided into like four subunits. Uh, so the first one would be engagement, um, then we have data collection, communication, and then overall mental health. Um, and just a fun fact, for our next um, cost meeting, we will actually be focusing on mental health uh, for the entire month of November because it has been a lot. We want to analyze where our students are now, especially coming back into the moment of um, moving more so into a face-to-face a, um, -face era um, back with colleges and universities across the state. Um, so I also hosted an information session with Zoom to pull some of these people because um, I'm a firm believer that we need more voice, voices outside of like student government and things of that nature. Um, so I hosted an information session, 40 people attended, and that was 12, 12 people from my university um, that wanted to specifically hop on one of those categories in the, um, the uh, task force. So we might need to amplify that across the state and see how we're going to do that. Um, moving down, I actually had la launched a program called Mask Up, Vax Up, Stack Up. So it's an incentive program. Um, I want people to, and I'm going to share the flyer with you, Dr. Reed, so that way you can see it. And I want people to actually um, take that initiative to, if you already got the vaccine, tell your why. Because like I said, I believe that student body representatives, that's cool. But we also need the people who are at the, st um, at the school itself to also offer their reason of why they got vaccinated. Um, in progress, so after our conversation with Chandler, he was the past um, student board member. We've been actually working on this master plan to actually divide Louisiana into two parts. So we have North Louisiana, South Louisiana, of course. Um, and the cost chair, she's going to handle South Louisiana. I'll handle North Louisiana. And we're actually going to go see 
these campuses to see how we'll work with. And Commissioner, you're coming also? Um, yeah, so we'll be working on these certain things. Um, also putting up like information to get it out for students. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, um, just moving more so towards what COSP is like focuses on. Um, so one of the big things that I've been talking about with COSP is the Push LA, and that's pushing undergraduate students higher in Louisiana. So basically what I want to do, and this is something that I wanted to target in September, but um, you remember the storm that happened, the hurricane that happened earlier in September, so we had to push that back. And my advisor, uh, she gave me some nice information. She was like, that's the perfect time to do it at the end of the semester, considering the fact that we had a hybrid semester um, in spring of this year, and then we're moving back towards like a physical semester this year, so the perfect time to actually gauge those students will actually be towards the end of this semester. So I'm excited to go ahead and launch that. And then also I want to target first generation students because if you do not know, I myself am a first generation student. Um, it's something that I actually take pride in. It's something that actually sits dear to my heart. Um, it was just me and my dad. So the whole time I was sitting here explaining to him what I want to do, he was like, oh yeah, you go son, you go for it. So I was like, I'm going to do it. Um, so I actually want to um, talk with Commissioner Reed a little bit about a scholarship project that I want to work on, and it's going to be called Breaking Boundaries, because that's absolutely what I feel like I've done. Um, generational curses, they do exist, but it's something that can be broken, and I'm excited to go ahead and start working on that. And then the last thing that I have for you is um, <laughs> I did a speed racer theme when I had campaigned at my school for um, student body president. So I have this information flyer called Get You Ready for the Race. Um, and basically what it is, is it's like um, I help people build, I guess, their resumes, personal statements, and things of that nature. And then I also have a section on there. If you go to my Instagram, you're able to book a chat and chew section. So far, 33 students have done that. A lot of students have came from like ULM, Tech, um, of course, Grambling, and then I've also had like two students from Xavier, and that's a private institution, but it was still nice to talk to them. So um, I'm trying to see how I could also uh, promote that in a different way, because I do want to hear more from students. So that is the last thing that I have. Well, thank you very much, Regent Jackson. Of Please course. keep up the good work that you're doing. We now move to item six on the agenda, which is the master plan update uh, on the Louisiana Math Forward, and Janet Newhall will guide us through that. Am I all right? Okay. It's been a while since I sat in this spot. It's nice to be back. All right, so uh, thank you, Regent Seal. Last October, you heard from Dr. Allison Cadlick of SOVA, who provided you with information on the importance of developmental education reform and introduced you to Louisiana Math Forward, an initiative aimed at tackling this issue. We are here today to update you on the activities of the project during the past year. To refresh your memory, the master plan identifies improving student success as a key component of reaching our state's attainment goals. Developmental education reform and the implementation of math pathways are named as the two highest priorities for improving student outcomes. Guided by this call to reform, Regent staff pursued an opportunity with the Education Commission of the States Developmental Education Reform Project, Strong Start to Finish. We received one of a handful of strategy site grants to launch our efforts, putting Louisiana on the map as one of the states leading in this work. The goal of Louisiana Math Forward is to support accelerated implementation of high quality co-requisite math models across the state with the intention to significantly increase the number of students who pass gateway math in the first year. Success in college level math early in a student's college experience is a critical factor in student success and significantly improves that student's chances in completing a degree. The traditional model for preparing students after high school is through prerequisite remedial courses designed to bring students up to the college level. But we now know that traditional remediation leaves a majority of students behind, which we will demonstrate in more detail later, and that enrolling students directly in a college level math course with just in time support through the co-requisite model is a significantly more successful method. To meet these goals, we engaged in a series of strategic activities in the past year. First, we identified the key partners needed for the project's success. This included a steering committee made up of math faculty representing all four systems to drive the work. 
We also engaged SOVA, an organization made up of national experts in developmental education reform. Our communication plan included a monthly newsletter that highlighted current research and provided updates on support activities like convenings and workshops. We also connected directly with institutional leadership to encourage engagement with this work. The substance of the work over the past year was in a workshop series aimed toward informing institutions on the why and how of implementing high quality co-requisite math. Some of the country's top math education experts from UT Austin's Charles A. Dana Center led teams of faculty and campus leaders through an interactive series of workshops that covered targeted data analysis, accurate placement of students, evidence-based co-requisite models, classroom practices that support student success, and high-quality student advising. The workshop's average attendance was 140 representatives from all 28 of the state's public undergraduate degree-granting institutions. Finally, the funding from Strong Start to Finish allowed us to offer many grants to our colleges and universities for additional targeted assistance. 21 of our institutions are currently working with technical assistance providers listed on this slide on activities like deep dive data analysis and faculty professional development geared towards implementing, scaling, and improving co-requisite math. Earlier this month, we asked our institutions to provide a report on the status of co-requisite math implementation on their campuses. Several of our institutions report that they're in the process of implementing co-rec math support for the first time, while others are in the process of scaling existing co-requisite efforts through additional courses or sections. Those with existing co-requisite describe efforts to improve outcomes through student support and faculty development. Institutions also identified some of the greatest barriers to successful implementation and student success. One was, of course, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on student persistence and success in courses that require direct engagement, direct regular engagement with students. Another major barrier was adequate funding to support necessary faculty development and small course sizes to support students. Now I'll turn it over to my partner in this project, Assistant Commissioner Mullen Baker, to go a bit more into some of the data and our plans going forward. Thank you. Um, to further illuminate um, the need for scaling math co-requisite in Louisiana, we put together a preliminary analysis of outcomes of students um, who are taking remedial math. Um, so we're calling from earlier in the presentation, remedial math is the required non-credit course before enrollment in a college level math course. And so indicated on this slide here, for every 100 students that enroll in remedial math in Louisiana, only 50 students passed. Of those 50 students, only 20 went on to take a college level math course in the spring semester. And then of those 20 students who took a college level math course, only 11 passed their college level math course in academic year 2020-21. Now if we compare this to every 100 students that enroll in a co-requisite math course, again, recalling that the definition of a co math course is that just-in-time supplementary um, instruction during the enrollment in a college-level math course. 49 students passed a college-level math course in spring of 21. So again, if we compare remedial math course performance to co-requisite math course performance, 11 students who took a remedial course went on to pass their college-level math course in 2020 to 2021, while 49 students passed a college-level math course in spring of 21. And so the comparison between remedial math courses and co-requisite courses is significant. And this performance and the trend associated with remedial courses is consistent with national trends as states are emerging in conversations related to reforming developmental education. And so we know through our work with Louisiana Math Board, there's something we can do, which is we can offer high quality co-requisite courses that just in time support uh, for students that allows them to earn that college credit. And so this preliminary analysis is really what informs our next step for this project for Math Forward and our work to scale math co-requisite at every institution with a solid plan for implementing high quality co-rec model. And so our next steps, we are conducting a comprehensive review of the effectiveness of the placement and co-rec policies 
based on national best practices, but we're rooting that in Louisiana data to ensure students are placed in the appropriate math course. Uh, tied to the work of placement, we will be engaging faculty in order to develop a statewide math pathways recommendations that aligns with college level math courses with the student's intended area of study. And lastly, we will continue to monitor the data and the performance of students in order to provide data-driven improvements to support student success in entry-level college math courses. And so to speak uh, today on the impact of Math Forward and scaling high-quality uh, math co-rec models, we'd like to call on Dr. James Amons. Uh, Dr. Amons serves as Chancellor of Southern University at New Orleans, as well as the System Chief Academic Officer for the Southern System. Um, and today he will briefly speak to his work and the future of math co-rec courses at Southern. Dr. Amons. Thank you very much uh, to um, Vice Chair Seal, uh, Honorable Members of the Board of Regents, Commissioner Reed and Commissioner, congratulations uh, again on, on your awards. Uh, I, I have to say that I am honored to be here this morning to speak on behalf of the Southern University system on what I think is some of the most important work that is going on in higher education uh, in this state and indeed um, in the nation. But I also want to express our enthusiastic support for uh, Louisiana Math Forward and all of the work that has been going on this past year, uh, developmental education reform in general. And I'm pleased to say that all three of the campuses, Southern University, Baton Rouge, Southern University, New Orleans, and Southern University, Shreveport, uh, Louisiana, have participated in all of the five workshops uh, that have been conducted. Participants included the campus leadership, student success staff, and of course, math faculty. All three institutions are also participating in extra support through the um, mini grant. And uh, I just wanna thank you all for providing uh, the resources or some of the resources that we need to be able to make uh, environments better for student success. Uh, for instance, at uh, Southern University at New Orleans, uh, where I serve as chancellor, uh, our mini grant project is with uh, Student Ready Strategies, and we are engaged in one-on-one -on -one, uh, student support, as well as virtual workshops that are geared toward improving student success. We were also fortunate enough to have some external funding that allowed us to open a new STEM lab, uh, which will include a component for math. And that lab is now uh, staffed with the director as well as tutors. And the other important thing is that this lab is not eight to five. It goes into evening hours uh, to provide support for our students. We also opened a new writing lab because uh, what we have found too is that uh, the writing uh, and uh, all of the communication skills are also important. Uh, I'm also happy to report that on the Baton Rouge campus, uh, this work has really been inspired uh, by the Charles Dana Center, but also some of you may remember uh, Dr. Tristan <coughs> Denley who is uh, Chief Academic Officer of the University of Georgia, who came a few years ago and made a presentation on best practices in uh, student success. So at the Baton Rouge campus, uh, we have taken an in-depth look at high failure rate courses, those courses in math, English, biology, art, even psychology. And we examine the barriers of student success uh, within these courses. And as a result of the uh, analysis that was done, the Baton Rouge campus developed a quality enhancement plan for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, and student success is the focus of the QEP. So one of the first things that we did there, we eliminated remedial courses. No more remedial. 
we now have co-requisite math and English courses. These courses have been restructured. They're five hours instead of the traditional three hours. And both sections of these courses are taught by the same instructor. So we believe that this too would be a best practice as we move forward. We also are partnering with the Gardner Institute. Uh, you may know about the Gardner Institute in the first year experience. We've hosted task force meetings with math, English, and the biology department. And we're also partnering with the uh, Franklin Covey organization, the seven habits of highly effective college students. And that book is commonly read now in our college success course. We've also revitalized the university college model under the Division of Academic Affairs. And now we have academic-based new student orientation for first year and first time transfer students, one-on-one -on -one academic advising, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, supplemental instruction, and we're delivering this virtually and in person. Also 24-7 virtual tutoring uh, via brain fuse and selective peer mentoring. And so with all of these, as we would do in this uh, era of institutional effectiveness, we will monitor and assess these practices, and we will continue to support Louisiana Math Forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you if the members have any questions of Dr. Amons or of uh, Janitor Mellon. Yes. You stated that writing. Turn your, is your mic on? It's on. Yeah. Okay. You say that you've added writing, and I agree with you that writing is usually uh, a, a red flag when you have some of the math and English issues. Do you have any indication how that's working? Or is, it, is it improving um, those students who are in your co-requisite math and English courses? Well, in the, uh, we do have experience with, some experience with the math. And those numbers are pretty close to the numbers that were reflected where we have uh, about 50% of our students now passing a college level math course as a result of prerequisite. The writing lab, we just opened this semester. Uh, but again, we'll be monitoring and assessing the effectiveness of that um, support unit. Regent Ewing? Uh, my question is along the lines <clears throat> of my colleague here, but you said you did away with remedial. Yes. And you went <clears throat> to the co-prerequisite. Co-requisite. <clears throat> was the only difference the amount of time and attention you gave the students there from three hours to five hours? Well, it wasn't the only difference, but that was a big part of it, where we now have um, what we would normally do in um, two courses, uh, we have expanded the time in that one course. We have the same instructor for both sections, and uh, we have all of the support in terms of tutoring, the one-on-one -on -one support, the um, other support services, which really sort of distinguishes co-requisite from regular courses. It's the real-time support that students receive. Well, on the information we have here, when only 11 out of a originally 100 sample make it to math, and uh, so this, I guess we have great hopes with the program that you're talking about and which we've been told that we can correct that because to have rem remedial in college to begin with is kind of a, a downer. But when you look at some of the scores and some of the things that we saw just in a recent report of how our universities rate across the state in math, reading, English. Um, there's got to be a new way, and hopefully this, new, this is a new system. Have you had it in place long enough to tell if you have good results? We do have some results <clears throat> for the math, and as I said, we, we now have about half of those students who are passing a college-level course. The, uh, reading, writing, we have just implemented that this semester. So then we could take heart that if only 20 out of 100 
we're passing from a remedial now 50 out of 100. Exactly. Well, of course, all of the research <clears throat> that we have seen through the workshops that we have attended, these are best practices, and these practices have generated positive results. That's encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Weil, you're recognized. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to congratulate you on these efforts. I think this is very, very important. My question is, what is the level of the co-requisite math courses that are being taught, and, and what is the level of the, quote, college level courses? Can you give us some idea on that? Well, the... Okay. Um, so the idea is that it is a college level math course that will count towards your degree. So this does include college algebra. This state does not require college algebra as the college level math. There are other options, finite math, statistics, others, it depends on the institution. Math pathways, which is a term you've heard, is our future goal to work on which college math courses correspond with various majors across the state to ensure students have the appropriate math course. That's one of our next steps. But co-requisite is offered as supplemental instruction to a college level math course that will count towards your degree. So these are not separate courses that you get credit for, but you have to take another math course just to meet your basic math requirements. The goal is that it is the math class you need to graduate. Okay, thank you. Regent Mayor. Oh, uh, Dr. Amos, I just want to commend you. Um, being a part of the Southern University system for years before I was here, uh, this is a bold initiative for you to take on it sooner. And I know that um, just because of the, the structure of SUNO uh, and, and your mission statement uh, in, in the city of New Orleans. So I'm glad you're taking on this initiative. I'm glad you're using best practices. And I'm looking forward to seeing some more data on how this is going to work. Uh, thank you very much. And, and again, we will closely monitor, assess, and we'll make adjustments uh, as we go along to make certain that we get the kind of results that we expect to have using these resources, but also using best practices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Janet and Ellen, does that conclude your presentation, or you have more? That does. That does conclude our presentation. And we also have on the slide here, uh, these are the members of the MAC faculty, the steering committee uh, that guided this work the past year. And so we wanted to extend their appreciation for meeting with us monthly over the past year, um, as well as SOVA, who supported us throughout this project. Thank you for an excellent report. And uh, thank you, Chancellor, for your report Let today. Let me ask thank you. one. Can I ask one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Baker, can you tell us how many of our universities still offer remedial courses that's changing this year uh we in the reports we just received they came in last week there are several of our community colleges who have not offered co-requisite before are transitioning are working on implementing new co-requisite courses um various the lctcs system has been working on transitioning away from remedial courses with the ultimate goal of the elimination of prerequisite remediation I can't say exactly how many are left because so many are in transition this year, but hopefully we'll be able to have that information for you uh, next time we come to you talking about this work. Regent Levy, did you want to be recognized? Is there, uh, pretty much is, in, is there any way that uh, we could start intensifying our efforts in dual enrollment and start getting some of this remediation done at that level rather than putting people in college and finding out that they can't achieve what needs to be achieved. I mean, to me, we've got this program going of doing dual enrollment, but we don't have good buy-in to the to the level that we need to have. But that would be one area, whether it's in English, math, reading, or whatever, that we maybe could make our students more capable of handling uh, the load at, at college level. And I just wonder if there's been any talk about trying to shift that emphasis from there, from the universities, where it's not cost effective at all, back to dual enrollment. 
There are models um, that include <coughs> high school courses designed specifically for the transition or in between courses. We've been focusing primarily at what is happening at the college level, but we will certainly add that to our research list of options. Well, is that, is that a crazy idea? No, well, it's, it's a great idea, um, and we absolutely will look at that. You know, we are promoting dual enrollment. We are trying to make sure we're focused on sort of dual track, right? So your point is an important one. Focusing on high school preparation and more students graduating high school ready to go. Uh, but also really leaning into this because as you see from the statistics and nationally there's no reason in America that colleges and universities should offer remedial education. The evidence is very strong. It's proven that co-requisite is where we need to go. And so I'm happy that for the last year we've tried to build the evidence base and the capacity at our institutions to understand that this transition is one that makes sense. It's proven. And so we want to continue to build the, the, the uh, support and analyze the policies. But you're right, uh, Regent Ewing, we, we are always on two tracks because we are big proponents of dual enrollment and very strong proponents for um, strong student preparation wherever they are. I'm certainly for helping any student at any point that we can to help them become successful uh, in their academic pursuit. But it seems like to me that we could shift the emphasis back down and use our dual enrollment program to better help them and better prepare them than waiting until they get to college and find out they can't, they can't it, cut the task. It'll, it'll have to be a dual track, Regent Ewing, because as you know, the average age for our community college students is 27 or 28. So we're getting students from all walks of life at all points of life, and so we, we will have to do both. Thank you. Can you come in? Yes, just this is wonderful work and I think it's important for us to continue to track because there's probably a strong correlation between that graduation we're, we're trying to close the gap on and getting out of the gate um, in your foundation and so it will be helpful to make sure that as we're getting numbers uh, commissioner Reed, that we keep track of the transition away how we're doing and how those numbers are correlating and even down to the per institution level if we can begin to see those outcomes changing thank you well excellent presentation thank you so much thank you we now move to uh, item number seven uh, reports and recommendations and we start with finance thank you Chancellor Amons appreciate you Terrence, given the magnitude of the report you're going to make, it seems like we we should have a drum roll or something. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chairman and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you once again the uh, preliminary funding formula and budget request for fiscal year 2022-2023. As you all know, today this process starts the uh, budget process for the ensuing fiscal year. Uh, of, upon approval today, this information or this budget uh, request will go to the Division of Administration, to Commissioner uh, Jay Darden and his staff and the Governor and the Legislature, and uh, that this will inform the uh, Governor's thinking on the executive budget. As you know, last month we had the Commissioner of Administration come and share with us the uh, kind of the state of the state, if you will, along with Greg Albright with the F Legislative Fiscal Office. And so we have those conversations ahead of time to inform our discussions and our proposals that we will put before you to make sure that we're uh, in line with their thinking and we're uh, working together. Um, I'll explain this numerical, uh, this chart that you have before you. There are four numerical columns. Current, uh, the, the column, the leftmost column, if you will, represents the $1.1 billion that we are currently allocated in higher education. Uh, this is broken down by the two-year and two- and four-year institutions, specialized boards, uh, tops, go grants. Yeah, I don't, it's not me. We've got some noise somewhere. Excuse me. How about that? <laughs> So the uh, leftmost column is the uh, existing operating budget, which is the amount of money that we have to operate in this current year. The second column from the left represents what it takes to fully fund higher education. So if you look, you see that we're currently at 1.1 billion. 
it takes uh, a little over $2 billion to fully fund higher education, which is nearly double what we have allocated right now. Uh, the third column represents the delta. You'll see that the largest variance from where we are to where we need to be is from the two and four year institutions. Uh, that amount is determined by a formula. Uh, a, formula a formula determines the amount of money necessary to run our two and four year institutions as well as our specialized institutions. And so again, you'll see that our two and four year institutions are farthest away from where we need to be to fully fund higher education. If we were to make a request to fully fund our needs, it would be $914 million. Knowing the realities of where we are with the budget, we know that that is not uh, feasible. And so we pair our request down to the farthest column to the, to the right to, rep to request an amount for the budget for next year that we think uh, is attainable and that will help us move along our goals. So the next column, there are three pillars of our uh, three sections, if you will, of the budget request that make up the $219 million. The first is institutional support and stability, which is $104.6 million. I'll briefly share with you the description of the uh, four requests that are within that uh, institutional support and stability. The first and foremost, uh, first and foremost, the $31.7 million for the continued phase in of faculty pay to the SREB is the most important request to our systems. The four system presidents uh, have determined, and along with the commissioner, that this is uh, very important to get us our faculty to the SREB average. The last time we were there was 2008, and we're looking to return there. Um, and that's gonna be for our instructional and non-instructional research faculty. The second request is $42.9 million for staff. We all know that in order to get there, in order to continue um, the good work and can reach our goals, support staff is necessary. And so in order to increase their pay, uh, we need uh, 42.9 to give everyone non-faculty a 4% pay increase. $15 million is to, drive, is to drive improved outcomes in our formula. As you know, we've uh, implemented an outcomes-based funding formula that's now in its fifth year. And uh, this will further the investment in research, equity, completion, and workforce initiatives. The next is $10 million for specialized institutions, which is a, just a 4%, not just a 4%, but it represents a 4% increase in overall budget for the specialized institutions. And finally, uh, last but not least in this section, certainly not least, is $5 million to support Title IX. As you know, this is a very important uh, topic that we need to address, and these, this $5 million will help us in terms of safety. We all know that whether it's campus safety, campus safety is very important to us, obviously, without things that are happening now. So we wanna make sure that we have proper lighting, we have uh, the proper um, training available to make sure that our campuses are safe, and um, that $5 million will help uh, toward that effort. The second pillar uh, is the budget stabilization, which is $18.7 million. And this was the second uh, most important to our system presidents and our uh, commissioner, is that we fund the mandated costs that we receive every year. Uh, some of these costs are legacy costs that are no fault of our own, such as pension debt. And so uh, in addition to the pension debt, there are also other uh, costs that we incur every year. And for many years, we did not receive an increase for these uh, costs. Uh, we're very, very thankful to uh, the governor and the administration and also the legislature for fully, fund, or fully funding the increase for the first time in a decade last year. And so it's gonna take about $18.7 million to continue funding the increase. And so we've made that request to the division. And again, that is our second highest priority behind faculty pay. I'll move on to the third and last uh, part of the budget request, which is the uh, economic recovery and master plan. And that represents $92.2 million. Um, the $30 million of this plan is to continue the completers fund to support short-term credentials and help students that are close to finishing uh, two and four year degrees. We had federal funds to support this at the two year level uh, in the current year or the past last fiscal year. Well, current year, I'm sorry. But we'd like to expand this program and also, uh, but use f state dollars so that we can continue the program and also extend it, expand it into our four year uh, campuses. Again, it was wildly successful with the two years. We were able, uh, the community college was able to see some success and we'd like to expand upon that. 
thirty million dollars to support uh, institutions as they implement or expand programs that will foster master plan alignment. Uh, that's of course very important as we look to achieve our goal of sixty percent of an educated citizenry, working age citizens by uh, twenty thirty, and that is made up of what the institution submitted to us as their priorities on how they believe they can reach our master, continue to reach our master plan goals. Student success is $10 million, and that is for GO grants. As you know, uh, this current year we received $10 million, or $11 million, uh, for GO grants, and that was the largest increase since the program's inception. We'd like to continue that. Uh, this uh, $10 million, if we are successful, will get us up to 50% of the need for GO grants. And as you know, of course, TOPS is $9.3 million. We anticipate getting that re request um, granted as TOPS has been funded, uh, fully funded since uh, the inception of the program with the exception of one year, and that is $9.3 million. And finally, it's the $5.5 million for the Foster Scholars Program uh, to, fully fund, to fully fund the implementation year. A few other things I'd like to, a few other uh, pots of money, one-time money, as you know, the state, um, is going to enjoy a tremendous surplus this fiscal year. Uh, it was a billion dollars, but I think available funding puts us in the area of 600 and whatever, six something million dollars. So we're gonna ask for some one-time dollars um, to support textbook affordability, to support dual enrollment, and all of the good things that we do within the Board of Regents. It's great for us to have that pot of money for the, to have flexibility to respond to uh, to needs, to campus needs, to uh, institutional needs, and also um, as things come up, we can work to um, towards digital inclusion uh, initiatives, early childhood, and all of those uh, initiatives. Um, last but not least, we're requesting $200 million of the deferred maintenance. Uh, as you know, the surplus can be used for six purposes. Capital outlay and deferred maintenance are uh, one of those purposes, or two of those purposes, and we're gonna ask for $200 million to address our deferred maintenance backlog. In the current year, we received 25, about $25 million uh, toward that effort, and it's gone a long way. And Chris Herring, uh, when he presents his um, report today, will also share with you the deferred maintenance and the capital outlay needs that we will also be presenting uh, to the board. And finally, uh, just to give you a summary, uh, this is an overall summary of what of what I mentioned when I first started the presentation. We're currently at $1.1 billion, and if we receive the $290 million that we are, excuse me, $219 million that we're requesting, it will place us at about $1.3 billion uh, for the next fiscal year. We believe that this is a responsible, uh, a robust but responsible uh, budget request that we will forward on upon your approval and we ask for your final approval of the state general fund operating budget request for all of the higher education systems, boards, agencies for fiscal year 22-23, and we will transmit this request to the Division of Administration uh, as required by law no later than November 15th, and we're happy to take any questions. Members, senior staff recommends approval of the state general fund operating budget request for all of higher education's systems, boards, and agencies for 2022 and 2023. Uh, do I have a motion? Mo motion is made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Regent Ewing? Uh, what is the total percent increase over last year? I maybe just missed that. So it's 20, the, the, the ask is 21% over last year. 21%. Uh, yes, sir. Any uh, other questions? Question. Regent Levy? Chair, Chair, how much more will be going to uh, We're requesting an additional $15 million to go to, toward the formula. And again, you know, the golden standard for the formula today, um, as determined by the, uh, the presidents and the CFOs, we want to get to 50% uh, base. You know, because you never want you always want to have a base that you can rely on. 25% outcomes and 25% cost. So, so current year we're at 58, Right. So we're there for uh, outcomes today. Uh, we need to lower our reliance on the base and put more emphasis on cost for the high cost programs. 
So that $15 million will help us toward that effort. Any other uh, questions? Of the 21%, how much of that is new programs? So it's a good question. Uh, if you look at, let me get to this last sheet. I can uh, go back and I'll share them with you. New programs, uh, of course, staff and educational. I would say Title IX support is the, we obviously have Title IX funding in the budget. We have money for Title IX, but such a uh, robust investment in Title IX support, I would say is a new uh, request. Um, we've always done master plan alignment, completers fund, what is it, completers? Yeah, completers fund, Matthew's telling me. That's another new one that we've requested for the, com the completers fund. And um, LASFA outreach, although we have funding for outreach in LASFA, we've, we're requesting $2.1 million for that as well. The 200, the 200 million for, uh, to try to upgrade our campuses and take care of problems we have there on the infrastructure, that's the really big one. Right. Tremendous increase, isn't it? Right, so we request that every single year. Uh, last year, we didn't receive any funding. Again, this year we received 25 million, but that is an ongoing request. So it's not a, it's not a new request, but it's one that's very important and we're gonna continue to uh, advocate, it's, it's, especially while we have the one-time dollars to do it. We look to really be successful. We hope to be, really be successful. Uh, Commissioner Darden, when he spoke to you all last month, stated that that would be a top priority of the administration for higher ed funding because of this large uh, surplus. So we look forward to uh, working with them to advocate to the legislature that we get some significant dollars for uh, deferred maintenance. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Uh, hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you, Terrence and Matthew. Thank you all. Next item is uh, facilities and property. Uh, Mr. Herring, the floor is yours. Good morning, members. Good morning. Um, the first agenda item we have this morning is the consent agenda. It contains both small capital projects and a few third party projects that have been approved since we last held a facilities committee meeting. Um, there's a handful of each. I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions if there are any out there. Otherwise, we recommend approval. Uh, members of staff has uh, recommended uh, approval of the consent agenda items, inclu including small capital and third party projects as presented. Is there a motion? Second. Motion by Regent Levy, seconded by Regent Temple. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. Next item is Act 959 project, the uh, GSU Johnson Center of Excellence and Student Success. Yes, sir. Um, the 959 project at Grambling will create the Johnson Center of Excellence and Student Success at Jeans Hall. Uh, a lot of the campuses have uh, created in the process of doing so, uh, the Student Success Centers. This project will be a complete interior renovation of the facility. The second floor will be a uh, collection of student services type activities, the registrar, admissions, financial aid, counseling, um, basically a one-stop shop for students. Um, the first floor will contain classroom space, some, uh, some technology and other public areas. Um, the project's just under $2.6 million and is funded with Title III federal dollars that are provided to HBCUs. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this one. Any questions? Uh, staff recommends approval of the consent agenda item um, for small capital, I'm sorry, for Act, Act 959. All right. I'd like to know Mr. Jackson's, uh, the impact that you expect that this will have uh, on the university. Absolutely. Um, so as it says, this is a student success center that we want to build up there. This is something that we need at Grambling State University to really push our students higher. Um, itself, knowing that what it has the potential to do and the influence that it will overall have at our university, um, I'm excited about it. I wish Perez was here because I know he will, he's excited about it too. So um, I'm also asking <laughs> that we do approve that that's something that I want. 
Any other comments? So with the uh, staff recommendation uh, and the motion made, we have a motion made and seconded, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and we've had discussion. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none, this motion passes. Our next item is uh, item B3, the lease agreement for UNO. Yes, sir. Um, this lease is between the University of New Orleans and the UNO Research and Technology Foundation. The foundation is seeking to lease uh, the Center for Energy and Resource Management facility on campus. They're going to create a small business and economic development hub uh, within the facility. Um, this will be a 35-year lease with the option for 10, four 10-year renewals. The, um, in addition, um, to maintain this, they'll be responsible for maintaining the space, but they're going to create a maintenance reserve fund up front with a deposit of 1.5 million, and then they'll contribute to it monthly based on the uh, square footage of the lease space. The, uh, they will also create an incentive fund up to $100,000 annually to provide for collaborative projects between UNO faculty and staff and the tenants within the facility. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this one, uh, and we rec uh, recommend approval. How does this compare to the uh, university housing initiatives on so many campuses? In terms, in terms of, of its structure? The structure. The, the housing ones are, are a little bit different. They'll, they'll lease the site to a, um, the f usually a facilities corporation, a 501c3, will mm -hmm. lease the site to somebody. The, um, the contractor will come in, build the facility, and then upon completion, if there is no debt associated with, associated with the project, they donate the facility back to the campus. If there is debt, um, once the debt's satisfied, then they donate the improvements back to the campus. Um, this is just a straight lease. They, they may, I mean, they're responsible for maintenance and operations, so there is the potential for improvements there. But um, UNO is still, um, it's still their facility, I guess. In, in the end, so it's just a little different structure. Does the lease uh, um, deal with uh, uh, maintenance of the facility? It does. It covers that. So the, it's a triple net lease. The foundation is responsible for maintenance and operations for the life of the agreement. And uh, the foundation is in existence now? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? The uh, staff has recommended approval of this lease agreement. Uh, is there a motion? Motion by Mr. Beer, Second. seconded um, by Regent Temple. Any, any discussion or any objection? Hearing none, the motion passes. Next item is uh, the uh, capital outlay budget, item B4. Yes, sir. This is the annual capital outlay recommendation that we submit to the division administration by November 1st of each year. The, the chart on the on the screen reflects the uh, number of projects and the dollar amount associated with those projects for fiscal year 22-23. Um, those numbers represent, um, like Terrence mentioned, we'll be asking for a larger portion of the deferred maintenance monies um, next fiscal year. Uh, there's also 27 deferred maintenance and life safety type projects included here, uh, as well as 34 renovations, which the renovations also eliminate the deferred maintenance backlog, and 21 requests for new facilities. Uh, the administration has funded a few new facilities over the last few years, so we'll be requesting to, to keep those moving forward. And then there are other requests um, related to infrastructure, the replacement of Lumcon's uh, Pelican vessel, um, some disaster recovery funds, and, and funding for the Lonnie Network. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions on a specific project um, or the request overall. Mr. Chair, Chairman, uh, I'm having a little trouble. We, we just got through talking about deferred maintenance yes, sir. and the overall budget of $200 million request. Help me understand how these figures fit in because you mentioned in two, on two occasions part of this was deferred maintenance. Yes, sir. I'm sorry if I'm slow about this, but tie me in with how your figures here relate to the 200 million that we talked about earlier. The 200 million, it will be inclusive of this with this request. Okay, so yes, it, these are included. Yes, sir. But these are faculty, I mean, you have recommended these. The staff recommends 
these this is where the money would be spent yes sir okay yes, thank sir. you any okay. other questions and the motion is made I'm sorry, who's made the motion? Okay, motion by Regent, me, Regent Wild, uh, seconded by Regent Ewing. Motion has been made and seconded. We've had discussion. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you, Chris. Next up is academic and student affairs. Dr. Craig. Good morning. So the first item on um, our, the academic and student affairs agenda is our consent agenda. We've got um, a termination of a BS in health and physical education at Louisiana Tech University, as well as some routine staff approvals, uh, many of which are programs being offered 100% online. And senior staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda. For the recommendation, is there a motion to pursue to approve the consent agenda? Motion, motion is made and uh, seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, is there any objection? Hearing none, uh, the motion passes. And uh, welcome, uh, Chair David. Great, thank you. I'll move ahead. Um, so next on our agenda are two items. We'll be discussing the governor's military and veteran-friendly campus report. We'll be discussing a, some policy changes to that report, as well as uh, providing you with information on the annual TOPS report. So for the governor's uh, military and veteran-friendly campus, just to just provide a little background knowledge, this um, act 232 of the 2015 legislative session address the need for a comprehensive system um, of statewide support and aid for our military veterans uh, transitioning from military service into enrollment in post-secondary education. In the six years since the, this law has been enacted, um, our campuses have um, implemented comprehensive services which include advising, mentoring, career development, and providing supports um, to help our military service members um, uh, meet completion. Uh, this year, I'm happy to report that 28, all 28 public statewide institutions have met the renewal requirements for friendly campuses, and this recommends 100% participation in the program. So all 28. Before I get into uh, the policy changes, um, there's just a few things I'd like to highlight for you about the program. The Military Friendly Program um, is a national program, and it's, uh, it's it, frankly, it's the longest running program of its type, uh, which supports military and veteran students and their families. Um, we have a, uh, through the Levette Corps, um, it's a cooperative program between the Department of Veterans Affairs as well as AmeriCorps, and, and they exist in, co in collaboration uh, to empower veterans' families and campus communities as they transition from active duty to being full-time students on our campuses. Um, on each campus, their um, MOUs have been set up between um, the institution and the Levette Corps to create a, um, uh, a Levette Corps navigator, which serves on each campus 30 hours a week to provide services for, for these veterans and their um, spouses as well as dependents. On the next slide, we'll talk about um, the, statu the statutory requirements governing the Friendly Campus Program. This year, Act 429, extended the voluntary uh, participation in this program to our Lake Q institutions, all non-public um, post-secondary institutions, and, and we are working with them on uh, bringing them into this program as well. 
Um, this policy is governed by um, RS 17, and I can't see that from here, 313.8.8. Um, uh, basically, this allows for a formal uh, rec recommendation or recognition, if you will, from the governor um, by designating um, each campus that participates, provides um, us with the data that they are um, required to provide the designation of being a military friendly campus. Um, this also provides for a solid um, transfer of military education training or experience. And we're working on an articulation method for this as well as, a, and then it will also extend to the Lake Hugh institutions. So here is our policy statement. The Uniform Policy on Military-Friendly Campuses is implemented by the Board of Regents pursuant to the mandate articulated in RS 17-3138.5 that we shall establish a process for a post-secondary institution to be designated as the Governor's Military and Veteran-Friendly Campus and pursuant to the Board's authority under the 1974 Louisiana Constitution to enact policies um, that support our master plan goals. So within this new policy, um, this we, we're providing a framework for the campus designation as a friendly campus. Um, we have worked um, with the Department of Veterans Affairs on an MOU, ensuring that each campus has a designated space on the campus that the veterans can easily find to get the supports that they need they have a, a site fee that is going to, that, that helps contribute towards this LeVette Corps Navigator and providing the Vet Corps Navigator uh, um, a way for them to actually contact the veterans. Um, a gratis letter of best practice recommendation um, on campus as well as um, uh, providing space for that Vet Corps Navigator giving them solid introductions with staff um, on campus so that it's a, a smooth uh, transition for the veterans. With that, um, senior staff recommends two things. Approval to forward the 28 institutions uh, to the governor's office with an endorsement as having met the requirements of being designated as a governor's a military veteran-friendly campus as well as um, we're asking for recommendation for approval of the policies, the uniform policy on governor's military and veteran friendly campuses. Members of senior staff has recommended approval of, to forward the 28 institutions uh, to the governor and to uh, approval of the uh, uniform policy on the governor's military and veterans campus. Uh, is there a motion? Motion is made and seconded. Is there a second? Uh, any discussion of the motion? Uh, hearing none, is there any objection to the motion? Uh, with no objection, then the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our, our next report this morning is uh, the TOPS annual report, which is required by law. You'll see here that our TOPS report is going to cover 10 years um, of data on the TOPS opportunity, performance, and honors recipients progression through post-secondary education. Uh, we look at four main indicators, preparation, participation, persistence, as well as graduation. And I'll be uh, going over just some very general findings that we found through, um, through our report. So, um, from 2011 to 2020, 86.7% of students eligible for a TOPS award accepted the award by enrolling in a post-secondary education institution. And just to make everyone aware, this is a 5% increase from last year. Uh, the average uh, ACT score of all TOPS recipients um, from this 10-year period was 24 and the average GPA of those students who, re who received the TOPS award was 3.44. Uh, during the last 10 years, 
uh, the majority of TOPS recipients were white, 72.5%, and uh, the majority of TOPS recipients were female at 58.7%. Uh, students who begin college with a TOPS award are more likely to persist and graduate at a higher rate um, than those students who were non-TOPS recipients. Um, the average time to degree for TOPS recipients um, pursuing an associate degree is 3.9 years um, compared with 6.2 years for those non-TOPS recipients. And the average time to degree for TOPS recipients pursuing a baccalaureate degree is 4.5 years compared with 7.4 years for those non-TOPS recipients. So I'm just going to talk through briefly uh, a few things on a, just a very few slides of note. This, um, this slide right here is um, talking about the eligibil eligibility criteria for uh, the uh, Opportunity Award, the Performance Award, as well as the Honors Award. Uh, one thing to note is for the, the, the graduating seniors of this school year, 21-22, um, the GPA requirement is changing for the Performance Award and the Honors Award. Um, for the Performance Award, a student will need to have a 3.25 GPA as opposed to a 3.0, and for the Honors Award, a student will need to have a 3.5 for this, uh, for this award. This was scheduled to go into effect before this year, but COVID pushed it back to the 21 22 uh, group of graduating seniors. On our next slide, um, this chart here gives us the renewal requirements for each of the tier of TOPS awards. Um, these are the same as last year. Of note, just to let you know, if a student were to um, uh, lo lose their award for maybe not, uh, not having 24 hours or or a GPA requirement and they remediate that and have the award reinstated, uh, they can only be reinstated back at the opportunity level. The next chart here, you'll see the distribution of awards. Um, uh, I'd like to just note that the, um, the UL system has the highest percentage of awards across the board. Our next chart illustrates that in 2011, 90% uh, of the class that were eligible to receive, receive the TOPS award enrolled in a Louisiana institution and received the award compared to 81.4% um, of uh, the class of 20. Uh, this difference could be attributed to a higher number of students taking a gap year uh, during the COVID year sitting out due to COVID or um, surrounding states offering competitive scholarships. On our next slide, the chart provides the average ACT and core GPA of TOPS recipients. Um, of note, if you look at the 2021 year, of students who received the TOPS award, uh, 20, uh, their average score is 25, so that has gone that has gone up from uh, the past years. And of the students who are who received the TOPS award and um, enrolled in a post-secondary institution, uh, the GPA also went up to 3.69. But I want to I, I must draw your attention to uh, the statewide average ACT composite score is um, continuing to decline. It is 18.4. I'd like to let um, uh, to know that this particular um, data point is for all the students that took the ACT. So that, that, includes, that includes your juniors, anyone who may have taken the ACT. Um, the score of the recipients are those who actually um, qualified for the TOPS award and actually received that award. Is it possible, just quick clarification. Absolutely. When did we start requiring all students 
to take the ACT? Um, and, the know, we have we looked at, we're growing the number of people who are taking it as a correlation? We can, we can certainly take a look at that. Um, I know that the Louisiana Department of Education um, requires that all students in the 11th grade take the ACT as part of their, uh, their school performance scores. I, I can't draw my, the year to my mind right now. Juan, do you know what year? Okay. So, um, but we can get that for you. I can't, it's been several years though. It's been, it's been, I don't know if it's been a decade because it happened during Superintendent White's administration. So within the last eight years for sure. It's just a question if the denominator is gotcha. influencing the performance. Yeah, we'll take a, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I'll, I'll get that for you, Regent Sterling. All right, let me see where I am. Okay, the next is a, um, the report shows um, TOPS recipients by race. And it shows you the, uh, the actual uh, number of students by race, you'll see um, we still have disparity um, in, uh, the, in the number of students, but uh, African Americans are at 2,500, white students are over 11,000. But of those African American students who are, are being awarded the TOPS award, you'll see that their score is a 22.8 as opposed to the net, um, the highest is 25.8 um, of our Asian students. So if you just scan across that bottom line right there. Let's look at last slide before this one. What yes, was sir. the drop off you think in 2018, 19? Looks like across the board just about, um, maybe not across the board, but the first four categories, there was a pretty, pretty steep drop off after progressing year by year. What do you think started happening then? Did anything catch the nation? That's before COVID. Yeah, that is before COVID. I, 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 um, it could be the number, the cohort of students in that particular a graduating class. It could be a, um, a relationship of, of actually the student populations who are graduating. I, I would be speculating at this point. I and mean, I can like certainly that, ask. It looks like 2017, 18 might have been just a big jump. Didn't you hear anything? They, they were, that was higher. If you can see, 2018, 19 is actually higher than 15, 16, and 16, 17. Um, so it's just, it, it, it could be just a, the makeup of that particular cohort of students. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next, we oh, I'm showing by gender. You can see that females um, uh, are outperforming. Um, males are receiving. Let me say that in a different way. They are they are receiving the tops award. About a third more females than males are receiving the award. And then we'll look at um, the TOPS award by uh, parental income. Um, you'll see that acro across the board, uh, those that uh, receive the TOPS award, the range is a 23.4 to a 25.5. But, but I'd like for you to take a look at the number of students within each of those categories. You'll see that um, I mean, what this tells me, again, don't, don't, don't like to make speculations, but um, income, family income does have an impact. If you have the opportunity to um, send your child to tutoring, provide extra opportunities, more times for that child to test, there is an opportunity for your score to increase on the ACT. Because if you see, um, when you look across the board, almost 30, 3,500 award recipients, the family income was um, higher than $150,000 a year. On our next slide, you'll see that um, in this regard, what we're showing, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> I was on a roll and then I, I, I skipped around. Um, Thank you. The four-year graduation rate you'll see here. Um, those who are scoring at the honors level are getting out of, of um, I'm just 
take, I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> it's a lot. Those, those who are scoring at the honors level are, are getting out in four years, right? You see, you see, and so that could be, it goes back to what Regent Ewing said earlier, um, they've had more opportunities for dual enrollment. They are starting out ahead of the game and um, they are actually in, um, graduating um, in four years. You'll see 68 by um, um, honors, 53% um, for, for the performance award and 24% the Opportunity Award. So there is, there is a significant difference even in those students who are, are receiving the award. If you look here for our statewide baccalaureate rate for those with the award, um, this is a, a six-year graduation rate. 88% um, um, honors, 76% performance, and 54% um, yes. Can I, can I just ask a general question? Sure. I'm going back. Okay. And I was, oh, I'm sorry. I was out of the room, but I looked over this. Um, and it's just, you know, looking at the uh, economic numbers on the about two slides back. The, the numbers are their, their scores. The, the income. Yes. Okay, I have two on the income. Do you want to look at is it this one or the other one? Their scores on the test or the number of students by income? I like both. Okay. And but, but I have an interesting question. I'm looking at over 150,000. Mm -hmm. Completely asking just to ask. But how many folks made over a million? So, um, over the last 10 years, um, a million and over was 11,381 students. Anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> but um, our, our counts are over 10 years. Gotcha. So. Okay. So about 1,000, 1,200 a, a year. Right. Okay. Just it, asking for me. I got it. Uh -huh. It, it would be helpful to show that other in kind of the rest of that distribution. And I don't know whether it's to get to a half a million and a million, but to stretch that distribution out. Um, it, it would certainly understanding the overall effectiveness of the program. These numbers, though, are very troubling and disappointing. Yes, I will say that the, the, the majority, from the majority of awards, um, 28,305 are awarded to those with a parental income of 25,000 to 50,000. Our next highest award um, amount uh, of, of 22,586 is uh, between 75,000 and 999,000. So, uh, so we're still the majority of the awards that have been offered or have been have been awarded are between the ranges of those with a family income of twenty five thousand and a hundred thousand. It tapers off after that. Yes. And we can share we can share that that chart with all of you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Just, thank you, Susan. Guys, this is going to bring up a, a whole nother deal that maybe we don't need to talk about right now. Probably not, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Go right ahead. Um, <laughs> what about considering, nobody would want this to happen while they're on the board, right? But considering... Um, because the child deserves the recognition. They do the work to earn the right to get some type of incentive like TOPS represents. They are, they've earned the right to be recognized as that type of student. Correct. Um, Merit-based. But, but if there was a way uh, to still put a cap on income or tier it or some way like that so that money can go further, right? I mean... I'm in a fortunate situation where I would be on the higher end. He's over there laughing at me, right? I, right? No, 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 right? Okay, but but uh, you know, income-wise, I, I, and my children will probably qualify for tops when the opportunity presents itself. 
But I wouldn't mind saying, you know what, they've, they've earned it, they did it, congratulations, but I'm still going to pay if they decide to stay in state because that money can go to somebody else. Am I crazy for that, anybody? Uh, may, I, may I respond, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. This was a terrifically intense discussion to make TOPS means tested. Yeah. I think that's what you're getting at. Right. Is phasing it out as the parents have more money, their children would receive less of the right. TOPS. That was a discussion that, that provoked enormous amounts of uh, intense reaction on both sides. Governor Foster was very hard against it. He felt like, but as you recall, TOPS started off targeting not the high-end students, the, the medium, but it became a middle-class entitlement. Right. And as you said, nobody wanted to be the one that said, wait a minute, let's talk about means testing. It has fallen off the radar, Collins. It's, it's not being discussed, at, as far as I know, at any level. Uh, simply the legislature comes in and funds it each year and says, see what we've done for everybody. No one fusses until you see this. Right. Until you see this. If we run out of money, as we did uh, several years ago, there right. was a time when we started running out of money. That was the only time I've heard the means testing come back up. So as long as they have enough money fully fund And it's tops, become synonymous with funding higher education when it's not, I mean, it's not the same thing. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, so I think it's something, I think it's something that we might need to consider and I guess we would be the people to uh, put that up. If, if you <laughs> recall, people. if you recall, two presidents ago at, at LSU, uh, we had a gentleman that had been in Massachusetts and other places, and he made the comment about he couldn't believe how many of the students on the LSU Baton Rouge campus were recipients of TOPS programs, monies, and were driving Mercedes and BMWs. Without a doubt. And he he took some uh, grief for making that some observation. Some significant heat. Wait till right. they don't have enough money to go around and you'll see means testing come back to the discussion table. Uh, just a, a couple observations. So obviously, uh, as uh, Regent Levy has said, there's, there has been significant discussion. The legislature's response was to add Go Grant, a need-based program. Uh, the challenge is that we fund TOPS at 300 million, Go at 40 million in a state that has as much poverty as we do in Louisiana. Our master plan goal and, and the, the audacious nature of our master plan goal is that we have said in Louisiana we want to try to do something that no one in the country has done, which is decouple student success from family income. Because the correlation between family income and student success is so significant. So that is, that is the mission of our work and the exercise that we are trying so desperately to do in a state that has this much poverty, move people from poverty to prosperity, and affordability and access and equity and math success, all of these things are critical conversations around all of that. So I, I just wanted to add that context uh, to the work. It is no surprise that uh, children of people of means are doing extremely well. This is not Louisiana specific, this is what it looks like all across the country. And so how do we make sure that your family's income and your family's education level does not determine your success? That is the exercise that we've taken on as a Board of Regents and all of higher ed to try to make sure we move students forward. And to me, it's, it's amazing that we have these top recipients at the opportunity level, and in four years, 20% or so are graduates. And in six years, mm -hmm. only about Classes, the second they start bombing tests, let's get them in. That's right. 
figure out what we can do to, to reach that and figure out how, how we can get this over. The, the TOPS program really came about to provide an incentive for students to do well in high school so that they could go on to college and be successful. It was designed to be a program of merit and to entice the students to take the courses that are necessary and to do well. You might say that we've kind of steered away from that in some regard and it's almost become an entitlement program and the allocation uh, as the fund has gone up so much, the amount that it takes to fund it has gone up so much, and I don't think it really does address what I consider certainly a super serious problem, and that is poverty and the children that come from poverty and aren't addressed uh, really from the time pre-K all the way up. And until we do something about that, which we haven't, except talk about it for 50 years that I know of. But that was the background. It was supposed to be a program to incentivize students to do well in uh, high school so that they could do well in college. And uh, that, that was of merit, but I'm not sure we've accomplished that now. Yes, of course. I think the other thing as we consider at some point the modernization, COVID is going to challenge our workforce and potentially think about is there a remain in Louisiana post-graduation component of that. Getting the degree is one part of it, but the flight of talent is significant. Yes. Um, in our state and how do we use dollars that we have to make sure that we support individuals staying in our state and contributing to Louisiana being a better place. Well, that's a fascinating topic. Um, it really is. Uh, and, uh, and one we should ponder at a retreat, perhaps. <laughs> that's good. Dr. Craig, is there more to your report? There, there, there is. I'll just quickly uh, gloss over the last few slides. Uh, just wanted you to, to look at the comparison between uh, TOPS recipients versus non-TOPS recipients. Uh, those who are not receiving TOPS are taking uh, almost twice as long to finish uh, school as well as, um, and the same goes for our associate degree programs as well as our baccalaureate programs. Uh, this particular slide just shows you how tuition costs have increased as well as the, the budget for the TOPS. The 2016-17 is that one year that was not um, completely funded uh, that uh, Regent Levy discussed, and you can see that on the, the chart here. And then you can see this, this goes, speaks to what Regent um, Temple just asked, you can see in 1998, there were 23,000 awards. We were at 55,776. Now, that's all of those, that's at, that includes everybody, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, that are receiving their award. But um, 55,776 awards were, um, were um, issued during last, year, last school year. So uh, with that, senior staff recommends approval of the TOPS report, analysis of the TOPS program from 2011 to 2020, and authorize the Commissioner of Higher Education to submit that report to the appropriate legislative committees on behalf of the Board of Regents. Members, you've heard the uh, senior staff recommend approval of the TOPS report and to authorize the Commissioner to submit the report to the appropriate legislative committees. Uh, is there a motion on this? Uh, motion by uh, Regent David, seconded by Regent Levy. Is there any discussion on it? I, I would just like to say uh, about that question, you know, the conversation that was had, if we can maybe just check on some of those things. Uh, we, are, we wrote it down, right. absolutely. We'll get you that information. Any further discussion? Uh, Regent David has pointed out that we need to make these votes by affirmative voice vote instead of by lack of objection. And so in that case, 
uh, I'll, uh, I'll pose the question, uh, all in favor of the motion, signify by aye. aye. And opposed, nay. Uh, the motion carries. Next is uh, academic affairs. And uh, this is Janet's presentation. Yeah. I am delighted to bring this to you. <laughs> it's been several years in the making. Um, we're here today to improve the way that we review academic degree programs, new programs, and the management of the statewide inventory of programs with some policy revisions. As you know, the management of the state's inventory of degree programs is embedded in the board's constitutional responsibilities. So first, I'm going to review how we do things currently. <laughs> Stop me if you have questions. First, for baccalaureate degrees, masters, and doctorates, they undergo a letter of intent process. The letter of intent is essentially an abridged proposal, and it goes through the campus approval, development and approval process, management board approval, and is submitted to the Board of Regents. Letters of intent are then circulated statewide to chief academic officers at every institution for comment and feedback and then it comes before the board. Institutions then go back and develop a full proposal and follow that entire process again. The letter of intent is very close to asking the same information as a proposal, so it's a bit duplicative. The full proposal is required for all new degree programs at the associates level and above, that includes undergraduate and graduate certificate programs, uh, associates, bachelors, masters, and doctoral programs. Those undergo a full proposal process that is the same as what I described, campus, system, Board of Regents approval. Letters of intent and proposals at all levels are submitted throughout the year as they are approved by the system. So when you are seeing these proposals on the agenda, staff have received them more or less in the same order that you see them and there is presently no clear statewide coordination of program planning we approve them we review them and approve them as we get them as they are approved at the system level at the system level so in order to think about the efficiency and effectiveness of this process um, staff engaged in a number of activities trying to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of our process in statewide coordination of degree programs. In 2019, the board authorized staff on a pilot basis to grant letter of intent waivers. This was intended primarily for programs that have minimal to no new resources. Often these are existing concentrations in programs that are ready to grow to full degree programs. And um, staff requested authority to grant letter of intent waivers for these to save the institution the time and the process of uh, the duplicative process of letter of intent review and approval and program proposal approval. Since then, we have granted 11 letter of intent waivers. The result of that was that a full program proposal, rather than the abridged version, which is the letter of intent, underwent statewide review by chief academic officers and staff. We found absolutely no evidence that the quality of the programs diminished because of it. It increased efficiency, time to approval, and the statewide review was actually more robust because there was more information uh, for those campuses to review in that process. We, uh, during that time, since 2019, have reviewed the process in several other states, and uh, we've discussed options on how to improve this process with system chief academic officers multiple times, and discussed it individually with campus provost chief academic officers, and we engaged in a focus group uh, to run through our ideas and plans um, to see what would work. And overall, at the end of the day, we've arrived at a point where we have support from both. The proposed new process would include the elimination of the letter of intent, which was originally designed to provide the board the opportunity 
to um, engage in statewide coordination and understand when an institution is in the development process to sort of pause that process early on. It has evolved out of that functionality and effectiveness. And we are proposing, and this is the biggest piece of our proposed change today, the annual submission of institutional multi-year academic plans. Every year, every institution in the state will be required to provide a list of what they intend to add programmatically, terminate, or make major changes to over the course of the next three years. Of course, recognizing that predicting what an institution is going to do three years from now can be very difficult. We're trying to be nimble and respond to um, need. But in the cases where an institution has long-term plans, this is an opportunity to think about those. It will, it has many benefits uh, as we're proposing it, that it will give the board an idea on what's coming in the coming year or two years. It will provide the opportunity for every institution in the state to see what other institutions in the region, including community colleges, and four-year partnerships. It will give the opportunity to engage our workforce and economic development partners in the review of these plans to make sure that as a state we're moving in the right direction with our inventory of programs. Uh, and just a note, full program proposals will still be required. So there will be a list of the intended programs reviewed and then the more robust proposals that detail faculty hiring, uh, facilities needs, courses, curriculum, and all the details uh, will still be required and go through the approval process. So just another way to look at this, um, the, currently we have separate letters of intent for each proposed new degree program at the baccalaure baccalaureate level and above. We're proposing an annual academic plan that lists all of these recommended changes with the goal of improving um, if the efficiency of the submission review and consideration process. Currently, letters of intent and program proposals are submitted throughout the year as approved by the systems. We're proposing the annual academic plan that will be submitted by all institutions once per year to allow the coordinated statewide review of program alignment with uh, workforce and identify gaps and have a clear picture of the graduate pipeline. Finally, detailed proposals are currently submitted any time after a letter of intent propose, proposal. That will be more coordinated according to the approved academic plan. And this will, of course, allow better coordination of Regents review. Um, and those proposals will continue to undergo the same rigorous review that they do now. So this is a summary of what staff, recommend, staff is recommending. We're in the nuts and bolts of it. So elimination of the letter of intent implementation of an annual academic planning process. The next item is as confusing as it sounds. Uh, it's a little bit of reorganization of policies to clean it up and make more sense, put all of our degree program items in the same policy and our research centers and institutes in a separate policy. Uh, add a statewide review of all program proposals. Currently, only letters of intent undergo the statewide review and we'd like to include associates degrees in the statewide review of all full program proposals uh, and we are requesting staff authority to approve undergraduate and graduate certificate programs the reason for that is they are designed with existing courses to meet immediate student and industry needs staff authority will significantly reduce the time to approval so that institutions can move forward with them. Some of them are highly successful. Some of them are terminated within a few years because they didn't pan out. There are no cost to, to institutions, and this could expedite the process. Um, of course, with regular reporting to the board so you know what is being added, terminated, um, and what is succeeding and what is not. And with that, if you have questions, yes, sir? No, it's, it's, it's con it can be confusing. <laughs> uh, so, all right, what has been the feedback from, is that, what is that? Oh, okay, I don't know what that is. Uh, okay, sorry about that. 
somebody's telling me I'm supposed to be in a Zoom meeting right now. <laughs> um, no, not Zoom meeting right, right now. We're no, in person. <laughs> right. Um, what is the feedback? I'm assuming y'all have gotten some feedback from um, the, uh, the college, you know, your colleges, yeah. universities. What do they think about this? And are they sure. excited about it? Are they? Yeah, so I think the letter of intent has been a thorn for a number of years. It evolved to, over time, asking more and more information. The board had more questions. Chief academic officers had more questions. Staff had more questions. So more information was requested during the letter of intent process, which has landed us here, which makes it feel very much like you're writing a proposal and going through the process twice. So for a number of years, institutions have been asking for the elimination of the letter of intent. Good. The academic planning process is new to this state. It has been in place uh, for many, many years in other places and it's become the norm. That was a bit more of a hurdle and part of why we've taken a while um, to work on it and develop it. I think the first year may be a little bumpy, but we're going to get through it as institutions start engaging in this annual review of their inventory and where they need to go moving forward. So some of the feedback was a little bit of hesitancy in sharing multiple years of plans statewide. Um, they are now on board with this idea because it's really gonna allow better coordination and partnerships between institutions, help with, um, you know, prevent unnecessary duplication before it's even an idea. Uh, so we've gotten support. When we did a focus group with provosts representing a variety of institutions, some of whom do several proposals a year, some who do them once every couple years. It was, we had a lot of support from the campus provosts who feel like um, this will work. Now, of course, the devil is in the details in this process, so we'll spend the next few months working directly with campuses and system CAOs to hammer out all those details on the expectations, the time frames, requirements, et cetera, um, to make sure that it, it works well for both. Well, we still get the same detailed information that Absolutely. we did. Yeah. So, so there won't be a lesser standard. Absolutely not. So the program proposals um, currently provide a lot of information and staff, we comb through that. We go back and forth with campuses sometimes for months to hammer out every detail. Who have you engaged with? Where's your evidence? Uh, there was feedback on this curriculum. Graduate level programs undergo external reviews. I mean, it's a very rigorous process. So the that part remains. And so there will be a list that's more of a conceptual review, but the rigorous program proposal review remains. I have a question, two questions. Sure. First, uh, what is the weight that you think should be given to the workforce and economic development component of these requests? Um, I will let Dr. Reed expand on that, uh, but we are, we currently request information on um, partnerships with the labor market and businesses and to ensure um, that campuses are coordinating with the economic needs of the state, we can do much better at that. And we have engaged, um, again, with workforce and economic development partners to ensure that an external review, uh, you know, leveraging our workforce people of Rito's, LED, et cetera, to help us ensure that campuses are going in the right direction. I, th I think that's exactly right. Uh, we already require, uh, as uh, Janet has mentioned, uh, the campuses to articulate their business and industry partnership and the need. Regent Ewing asks us every time we approve something, how do we know this is relevant to the world of work? So this, uh, I don't think we've talked, uh, Regent Seal, about the waiting yet. We wanted your approval for the concept and we're gonna build it out and come back to you. Um, but we certainly understand that the education to employment conversation has to occur uh, and we wanna make sure it's robust. I will tell you I'm very excited about this process. It moves us out of a receivership uh, approach to one that really is driving strategic planning so that we can not only re react to what's coming, but to ask the question, why don't you have a cyber program or have you thought about partnering with this? So um, just, I, I really am excited about it. Uh, it's been significantly vetted, but obviously we wanna make sure the board understands it and is, is happy with what we're proposing. Re related to, uh, to, to this, uh, it would seem to me that 
there should be a place in this for a fast track approval. If someone presents you with a program that has already been tested and demonstrated in another setting in the state and is succeeding, and you don't think that it's a duplication of services that would, that would create a problem with that, then there should be a mechanism for fast track approval mm -hmm. and, and not put the universities through and, and the staff through the process of documenting what's already working exactly the same way in some other place. This exists in other states, so we can certainly yeah. look at very good point. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have, I, we have ideas on a time frame because we want to we we wanna make it so that we have time to do the rigorous review at the regents level in the shortest reasonable time frame. So I hesitate to give you a, t a time of year just yet until we sort it out with campuses because we also want feedback from campuses on when is a reasonable convenient time of year and we'll work around that. Okay. Yeah. And the next one was, so it said the academic Yes, we, we will set up a process that will be an internal process with, um, with meetings, uh, individuals invited. We can have a conversation, uh, Regent uh, David, by industry, by region, um, you know, by two-year, four-year, et cetera. I mean, there are lots of ways to slice and dice the conversation, healthcare. Um, so we wanted approval of this process, uh, of the concept, and then we will flush through all of that and have you respond to it. Uh, but we were certainly engaging. Uh, our vision was to have some robust uh, feedback and planning conversations. And you can imagine, as Terrence puts on a really effective um, fiscal budget hearing, which is a whole day of conversation, you can imagine us spending some time on an academic planning day or multiple days to talk about this process, right? We don't want to just bring it in, have a few slides, and approve it. We want your your best thinking and your best engagement in how we do this right. My co I don't know, do you have another question? Well, I have one more okay, other sure. question. Uh, so if, you, if there's a debris program where it might be, it's not in their annual uh, plan, mm -hmm. but comes up and they just submit the proposal, they're allowed to do that even though it's not in the plan? We've got um, drafted an off cycle process and we've discussed this with campuses and I know this is definitely a concern in our community college level in particular um, you know shorter term credentials and fast approval so we are working with system CAOs already on an off cycle approval process my question is related to reporting you stated that the staff authority is going to be approving you're proposing that the staff authority approve the certification programs and that you will report back to the board how often do you anticipate you'll be making well uh, in most agendas probably all at present we include routine staff approvals so staff are currently authorized by policy to do a few various routine things um, and this would be added to that list so we could every month when we report on the variety of routine staff approvals include the certificate programs that have been improved since the last meeting. And we have also already promised the board an annual report on certificate programs, how they're doing. Uh, we intended to bring one to you this year. Undergraduate certificate programs are a very new concept. They were just approved by the board a few years ago. We don't really have anything to report just yet. So we're gonna postpone that see if we can get some um, more robust numbers this coming spring. So annually we would talk about our, certi our menu of certificate programs uh, above the associate level and what they're doing for our students in our state, uh, as well as we can regularly report what's being approved as we go along. Thank you. So would you uh, restate your staff recommendation for us, please? Sure. Uh, senior staff recommends approval of the revised Academic Affairs Policy 2.04 and 2.05, effective January 1, 
and that the board authorizes staff to develop relevant guidelines, templates, and forms to support those revised policy. Senior staff also recommends that the board grant staff authority to grant conditional approval of undergraduate and graduate level certificate programs with regular reporting to the board. Members, you've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve these items? So moved. Second. Motion uh, made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? In that case, uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed, nay. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Next, uh, statewide programs. Thank you very much for that report. It's interesting to hear. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Butte, we have a long list of TOPS questions for you. I know you were back there texting your staff. I, I actually <laughs> have the answers for you. So I'm you not surprised. I'm to you now. <laughs> or uh, would you like me to give you the answers to those questions sure. now before yes, we start? The first one that I recall was the uh, census testing for the ACT that was announced 2012-13 and then thereafter. So in the 2012-13 year, that was per the Department of Education. Uh, the second one was that you saw a decrease in the number of recipients. That was not due to the reduction in TOPS. That was the 2016-17 year. That could be several factors that could be most likely affected by the number of graduating students, seniors. So if your graduating class is smaller, right, even though you are, you, your number of eligibles might remain the same, your denominator decreased. So that's what you're likely seeing there. There was another comment about when the need-based aid component or when the needs component came into TOPS, you know, it was when you didn't have money. So to be clear about that, that was the law. Before that 1617 decoupling TOPS with tuition, right? Because why do TOPS keep exploding? Well, your tuition kept going up. And TOPS was the amount equated to tuition. So if your tuition goes up, the amount for TOPS goes up, right? So you decoupled it in 1617. Prior to that, you had, if there's ever a shortfall, we're going to start with students that are demonstrated need, and you're going to knock off those students that are um, more fluent and, prepare, and less prepared, and you're going to keep going down until you reach it. When you decouple 1617 from tuition, the legislature, there was also a, okay, here's what we're going to do if there's a shortfall. We're going to do, a, as in the South we say, all y'all is the plural of y'all. You're all getting cut. Right? There's an across the board. So if there's a 15% decrease, guess what? All y'all receive a 15% decrease. So there is no, this is what this one gets and this is what this one gets. So that was a decision by the Louisiana legislature. Uh, a thank you to Regent Ewing because he nailed it on the head. He always does. He does. And he was there. If the purpose of the program and you're going to hear some ACT statistics in just a minute that are going to answer your questions, like straight up close and personal. If the purpose of the program was to keep during that brain drain in Louisiana, that was Governor Foster's time, we had an out-migration task force. I worked at the Department of Labor. I was Assistant Secretary at that time. Up close and personal knew that. Folks were leaving this state in droves. So it's, well, what can we do to get them to consider staying in the state for post-secondary? Because if you lose them at post-secondary, you're not getting them back when your economy is not diversified. We're still working on that, right? So it was, what do we want our students to do? We want them to take, uh, not use the senior year as, okay, I only got to go half a day, right? So you implemented the core four, right? And you aligned your cores, and you made it challenging. And you said, I want you to take a rigorous curriculum. I want you to keep taking the ACT. Ah, uh, the commissioner's going to show you the data that shows that, that works. And it works more specifically for students of limited income. I want you to keep taking the ACT. I want you to challenge yourself. I don't want you to have a vacation of a senior year. I want you to go all the way through. And guess what happened? 
those students in schools that are doing a good job of preparing them met that challenge. Those students who are well prepared in your post, in your secondary pipeline to get to post-secondary, remember Dr. Ammons? What'd he say? If you didn't come in prepared, you don't have a great shot. You really don't. So we've got to start back on that pipeline to secondary and start asking ourselves, which institutions of secondary education are doing a stellar job of preparing students of color, as well as students that are not in the minority? BIPOC, so who's doing it well? Because if they're not prepared going to you in higher ed, no, they're not going to do well. Now, how does she know that? Well, it's a personal pet peeve of mine, but your TOPS data showed you that. They showed you that they graduate what? At almost <laughs> less than half the rate, right, of those that weren't prepared, right? They graduate and complete at a higher rate. That was another one of your questions. Yes, they do. And why is that? Well, when you go back to what was the average ACT in Louisiana, it dipped. Top students, it went what? Up. GPAs, meh. Top students, it went what? Up. What did the legislature do? They said, no, we're going to raise that bar. For you to get a performance award or an honors award, you've got to go to a 3.25 and a 3.5, and we're going to give you four years of warning. You know what those students did? Hey, hey. I hear you and I'm going to raise you. So now all of a sudden we see in TOPS more students getting the performance and honors awards than the increases in the opportunity. And guess what you see when you do that? Uh, preparation. That you see a decrease, right, in students losing those awards. So as the performance and honors keep it and don't revert to opportunity, and as the opportunity students get more prepared and challenge themselves and keep it, y'all got to pay more. But at the end of the day, what did you say your goal is? What'd you say? You said to have students well prepared to be able to go into post-secondary with a snowball chance and torment of succeeding. And I say, we are the Yeti cooler that helps that along. Because <laughs> they ain't going to get there without it. <laughs> right? So to me, what, I, what we are focusing on, what keeps me up at night, is, well, let's just root out who's doing it right and doing right by these students. That's your taxpayers' dollars, and it sure as heck's mine. I'm not a happy camper on the 15th of April. Right? And I paid tuition for my kids, and I paid for the taxes, so hey, hey, I'm not getting back. Yes, they did earn that, right? But why don't we deal with what the commissioner said? How do we promote equity across secondary and across post-secondary? And let's just look at all y'all and who is doing right by BIPOC students and where they are achieving just as well as students that are not. BIPOC. And in there, we will find the nexus that says, and if that is what we believe should be done, that is what we should fund. And I personally think that a needy student who's meritorious, right, should get need-based aid, and they should get merit-based aid, and I think it is a great disservice to tell a needy student, a BIPOC student, we got to need, get need-based aid for you. Ooh, really? I'm hot if you tell that to my child. Because that means you just told me that you didn't think they were going to succeed out the gate because of the color of their skin. And I do not think that's what we mean. We mean you got a shot, and we're going to be that Yeti cooler, and we got to figure out what Yeti figured out. How you keep ice not melting when it's hot outside in the south? Well, they figured it out, right? So that's what we're here to do. Thank you, Mr. Ginn, wherever he is, for requesting for more outreach money for LASA, because that's what we intend to do with it, right, is to get that done. So the top, the income has been emailed to you. Christine has that link. But just so you know, the top 
five income, and I think this is really interesting because we can get real, real cranky with those numbers. But when we look at it, the majority of students uh, that are recipients by parental income, 25K to 49,999, that's needy. That's the top group that receives tops. One with your top five now. Next group down, uh, 26,502, that is 50K to 75K. Mm, that's not affluent in this economy. All right, then the next group, 100 to 124 K, that is your 24263. Then you get into the million and over people, they are further down. And then it dwindles, the next number is 15,000, 13,000, 10,000, 6,400. And when you get into the heavy rollers, the 875 to 899, that's 48 students and 46 students. So can we do it? Can we be the Yeti cooler? Yes, we can. But it will take all of us together. And Regent Ewing, I personally thank you and the legislature for having the wisdom to invest in our Louisiana students. And as long as I'm in this seat, and I might be out of it tomorrow, and that's okay too, I will continue to fight for all students to get a fair shake. And to say to all students, you deserve as much money as you can get, and merit-based aid ought to be what you are shooting for. Right? And need-based aid is a Sunday on top because we're going to give you extra if you cross that threshold as well. And, and we do have two folks that want to meet with you and get you as a part of our networking groups so you can motivate other students because we believe. And if somebody had said you couldn't and all you'd qualify for for need-based aid because you were first generation, how hot should your daddy have been? <laughs> and you, right. So on to what I was called up here to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short one <laughs> after that. Our first and only consent agenda item today is approval of the rulemaking to implement Act 457. And basically, you know that is the MJ Foster Scholars Promise Program. Uh, the LASPA Advisory Board recommends approval of this consent agenda item. We are currently meeting every two weeks so that you will know with representatives of the LCTCS system, the Southern uh, in Shreveport campus, and the LSU Eunice campus because that program is not just limited to the LCTCS system. And we want all of those folks involved with our almost entire team on rolling this out uh, for this next um, frontier that we're going for, which is resources for uh, returning adults. So a great moment. So we do uh, recommend that you approve this agenda item. Members, uh, the LASPA Advisory Board recommends that the Board of Regents authorize the Executive Director of LASPA to publish a notice of intent to make these rules permanent. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion and second. Um, is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed, nay. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Brute. Thank you. Our next item is uh, planning, research, and performance. Uh, yes, sir. Our con we have a consent agenda item on our the PRP committee. Uh, we have four renewal applications for licensure. Bard Early College in New Orleans. It's a private institution in New Orleans. Um, their campus is in New Orleans. Uh, main, their main campus is in Annandale on Hudson, New York. Um, it's accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, and it offers online classroom instruction, uh, laboratory, as well as independent study in the New Orleans area currently enrolling 104 students. Uh, our, the next um, institution is Central Michigan University. It's a public um, institution with its local campus in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, it uh, um, is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. It offers online and classroom instruction. It has a Master of Business um, Administration and a Master of Science in Administration program on, at Fort Polk, has seven students enrolled. South Louisiana, uh, excuse me, not Louisiana, just South University. It's a private institution uh, from Savannah, Georgia. 
Um, it's currently enrolling 41 Louisiana students, and they offer programs in business, legal and criminal justice, public administration, psychology, and healthcare. And our fourth is the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences. This is a private um, institution located in San Marcos, California. Uh, it's accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, and it offers online and internship programs, primarily field work and practicum instruction. Uh, in 15 academic programs, they are well known for uh, nursing, health sciences, and physical therapy. Uh, it currently enrolls 17 Louisiana students. We have one initial application uh, for SARA, uh, the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, and this is for a proprietary school. Um, Digital Media Institute at Intertech um, is wanting to, um, to become a SARA institution with us as well as um, our proprietary schools, of which uh, the Proprietary Schools Advisory Commission met on September 20th um, to hear initial and change of ownership applications and to review renewal applications. Uh, the commission presents to you uh, five initial applications. We've got two change of ownerships as well as 25 license renewal applications. These are our proprietary schools. And senior staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda. Members, you've heard the recommendation for approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Okay. Motion is made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, yes, phlebotomy is, that is the um, official term. In fact, Regent Sternley might be able to explain it better than me, but that's where you learn to take blood. Okay. I might get asked, well, you have to be close to general phlebotomist. Okay. <laughs> and a person who can do it is a phlebotomist. That is a person who can do it is a phlebotomist. That's right. That's right. And we want, a, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> that's law school. Those, uh, <laughs> Those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay, and that motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, and now we have the commissioner's report. Uh, thank you so much, Vice Chair Seal. Uh, first of all, let me just say that you, we appreciate uh, Regent uh, Jackson's comments. Obviously, we're very concerned about campus safety, student safety, doing all that we can to support that whether it's lighting, education and training, sexual misconduct, all of those issues. Uh, we are in conversations with campuses and systems and legislators, as you know, moving that work forward. To that end, I'm certainly happy to report that all the campuses have posted their Clery Act annual reports, their updated semi-annual reports uh, to their websites as required by state law. Um, shout out to uh, Dr. Allison Smith for doing the verification work we have notified all the system presidents of their compliance. Uh, you see uh, on the slide before you, and this certainly will be part of our conversation, um, Mr. Chair, as we uh, embark on a, a retreat, a mini retreat to discuss pressing issues. But uh, this week, the ACT numbers were released. As you heard, we are down uh, nationally and in Louisiana in terms of ACT composite scores. Um, but when you look at the TOPS numbers, you see that those uh, ACT numbers and GPA are up because we know that academic preparation matters. When we look to see what sort of the glass half full information within the ACT report, we saw that even with COVID and we had significant uh, disruptions, that over 50,000 students in the class of 2021 did take their ACT. So that's 98% of the graduating class were able to do so, and that, that is a reflection of some tremendous work on behalf of uh, the schools and others to try to make sure that students had that opportunity. We also are number two in the nation for fee waivers requested and used, and what we know from the report is that students who take the ACT more than once are statistically much more significant to have a higher number. I think it was three percentage points 
increase if you uh, do that. ACT has provided waivers based on free and reduced lunch for free waivers. And so we are number two in the nation for asking for the waivers and using the waivers for our students. So more work to do for sure, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware uh, that we are uh, looking at that ACT information. Again, erasing equity gaps and erasing equity, um, advancing equity and opportunity is critical for our state and we have much more work to do there. Uh, I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Julia Letlow for meeting with our chair and members of the higher ed community. She is serving on the U.S. House uh, Education and Labor Committee in Congress and is doing a tour around the state talking to constituents about needs and really had a great conversation, uh, Chair David, about the priorities of higher education, how she can help to support us, one of two uh, women on that committee who have education background. As you know, she worked at ULM, knows the policies and the issues, and so really thanks to her for a great conversation, and we look forward to more engagement with her in the future. Uh, two national conversations that I'll just mention briefly. PNPI does the um, educational training and professional development for congressional staffers. And I had an opportunity to participate in a panel this week uh, for them to talk about higher ed policies in Louisiana. The specific questions were around state authorization. How do we address quality uh, when it comes to proprietary schools, whether for profit or not for profit? Uh, and so that was a great conversation. And then on Monday, had an opportunity to address education, uh, Writers Association, which is hundreds of education uh, writers from across the country. Our panel was around federal and state policy. Lots to discuss there, obviously, but again, an opportunity to talk about how Louisiana has positioned our attainment agenda as a recovery agenda, talking about our institutions as strategic assets, and really thinking about how to innovate in a time of significant disruption. So just wanted to share uh, those uh, opportunities. Always delighted to talk about what Louisiana is doing uh, on a national stage as well as within our states and locally. Uh, and we really had some great opportunities to do that. So with that, Mr. Vice Chair, that is the report. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, and I'm happy to handle the next item for oh, you. Oh, please. Yes. So other business, uh, you have the calendar in your binders. It was also sent to you for uh, approval uh, for 2022. Um, and it includes um, in the information um, the um, single day meetings when we have the legislative session. Um, it also allows us, it has an asterisk, but it has uh, twice a year we were pre-COVID visiting college campuses. And so that is embedded in the calendar with a note that subject to COVID, we may not be able to do that, but if we can, we will. Um, and it also has a placeholder for a November retreat. We do not meet as a board in November, but we were trying this year to have a retreat in November. So we've scheduled that TBD on the calendar. Uh, so with that, Mr. Vice Chair, I just wanted to highlight those items and encourage you all to hold those dates on your calendars. Thank you, Commissioner. Would you like us to approve of the calendar uh, by yep. motion? Yes, please. Uh, the uh, Commissioner has uh, recommended the 2022 meeting calendar. Is there a motion to approve that? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion on that calendar? All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion passes. Is there any other business to come before the board? Mem members, we do not have a meeting in uh, November. In December, we'll have our board social, um, followed by our joint Bessie Regents meeting on December 16th, as well as our regular meeting. Um, is there any other business? Hearing none, we are adjourned. And, and your lunch is in the back. The There's box lunch for you oh, if you want to grab your lunch.